all of the sessions at Insight are very, very special, but I believe that this one is very special because it's a mixture of what the work that we do at the Midlands Decision Support Network, which is a wonderful network that, uh, are, are, as the name suggests, supports analysts who are helping decision makers make those key decisions. And this is one of the kind of um, lectures and talks that we give as part of the MDSN. If you're in the Midlands and, um, and follow the footprint, and again, we can share details. If you want to be part of that network, please let us know and you can join it because all of the ICSs have signed up. If you're not part of that network, please let us know because there are other networks around the country and we can help you uh, untie into those too. So uh, um, um, we will go through. So this is day three of Insights 20, uh, um, 22, and it's uh, um, a piece of work that we want to talk to you about, our population health management um, series of lectures, but a key one around how systems work together. So um, some housekeeping, uh, um, please keep your microphone muted during the session, uh, um, unless we're being completely outrageous and you want to stop us. Uh, uh, um, I will be monitoring the chat uh, um, when um, Sally's talking, so I'll try and gather your questions and we'll go from there. Uh, um, as you have been doing so well, so thank you ever so much for sharing and introducing yourself in the chat box. And please use the chat box function to ask questions and raise you know, any technical issues as we go through. The sessions are recorded uh, um, and, and put onto our website. And please tweet about the session on Insight 2022. So uh, uh, my name is Andy Olavsky. I'm a health economist and I'm the director of the Health Economics Unit, uh, um, a wonderful team that is supported by that equally wonderful Midlands and Lancashire Commissioning Support Unit. Uh, um, and of course, we have the, the, the amazing, the indomitable, the, the awesome Sally Markwell, who uh, um, I was very lucky to meet uh, uh, um, at a lectures uh, she was giving uh, uh, many years ago. And like a fanboy, I was there falling <laughs> after her, demanding that we find something to work together on. And um, I'm, I'm so lucky that we're able to work with her on this. Um, Sally will tell a little bit more about her and her work later on when she goes to it. But uh, um, Sally's work around how systems work together has never been more relevant than it is today when we're looking at integrated care systems. And hopefully we'll be talking about that going forward. And the challenges, not just uh, um, that you will face, but uh, how systems will face and how they work together and uh, um, unlike me, which will just talk about problems, Sally will talk about some ways that we can move forward and kind of pull these things together. So hopefully that um, uh, all makes sense. There are a whole load of other really exciting events coming up, uh, um, just to let you know. So there's a wonderful one about smarter decision, make, decision making for your population, which is a follow up to this session um, tomorrow from 10 to 11, where we're looking at work that's actually taking place in ICSs across the country right now. So five ICSs are involved. So we've got Birmingham, Solihull, um, North Hants, Nottingham, Gloucestershire and Coventry um, all being involved and we'll be sharing the work that's going on from there. Um, then you've got, uh, um, again, uh, the future of healthcare analytics. There's another great session um, around um, the big decisions that have affected data and analytics from HSJ, which I think will be a great one on the 25th. But loads of great stuff. Please sign up. There's always room for more. So on to how systems work together and, uh, uh, um, and say the key part of today's talk. So I'll be covering these wider determinants of health and what are they and why they're so important, why systems work together, and one of these kind of uh, um, uh, kind of complex issues around over-medicalization and when we're looking at systems working together. Sally will talk about the challenges and, of course, ways of improving um, system working. And with, as always, because she does her homework, relevant uh, um, uh, examples from the Midlands, because this is part of the Midlands Decision Support Network. So what are determinants of health? So one of the key reasons, and I'm sure you guys know this, one of the key reasons is uh, that we've created integrated care systems, is that we cannot concentrate now or, or keep concentrating all of our resources on just healthcare. If we concentrate just on healthcare, we're only affecting 20% of your health outcome. So 80% of your health outcome comes from these wider determinants of health. So your physical environment, and we've seen a lot of talk recently about people living in, um, in terrible housing, and you look at people who are living in wet, damp homes, and not only how it affects the, you know, their mental health, but also their physical health and, and you know, the well-being of the family as a whole. Social economic factors about being able to afford things and to be able to do the right things. And as you know, this winter is going to be an absolute crisis 
for many of our population with uh, rising um, um, with rising inflation, food costs, and of course fuel um, going forwards. It's a real issue. It's only going to get worse, and it's going to be a real challenge for us in healthcare as well as all of the other kind of elements that go from it. And of course, our health behaviours. And you know, and if you're like my mum, who was um, overweight, um, smoked a lot. And uh, um, I had rampant diabetes that she didn't like to control. She would say, well, I've got to die of something, haven't I? And, uh, um, and of course, what can we do about people with health behaviours to help improve their health going forwards? So some key elements. So one of the reasons that systems need to work together, the reason that we created integrated care systems is that healthcare, so our friends at primary care, secondary care, community, social uh, services uh, um, and beyond, would be working with arm length bodies and hopefully starting to work with um, wider organizations like um, environment, education, uh, uh, um, justice, and moving forward from that. How can we all work together to better affect this 80% of your health outcome rather than playing with some marginal gains on that 20% as we kind of go forwards? So some key and horrible startling facts. Again, I, I'm sure that you've known about this. So one in five dwellings doesn't meet decent standards in England. And we've seen recently the death uh, of, uh, say, uh, of one of our you know, young population because of their house was uh, um, in such a state that the mould and, and the dampness um, led to his untimely death. One in five people live in poverty in the UK. Um, new figures, these are figures taken from the Health Foundation, New figures show that's most likely to be one in three um, coming up to um, Christmas. And uh, um, not only people in poverty, but we're then going to have more and more people in deep poverty. And just to remind you, poverty is about £140 a week. Deep poverty is £70 a week. And then destitution is half of that again. There are people you know, living in our communities who are struggling to engage with healthcare in the way that we want them to because they live in poverty. They can't keep their homes warm. They can't uh, uh, have access to, to food uh, I mean, in the same way. And these are people that we work with, people that we know. Children in deprived areas are nine times less likely to have access to green spaces to play. And so where do they play? Are these areas safe? Is it good for their well-being? Uh, are these places you know, with high pollution? And of course, those uh, um, um, of the age of 30 or above with the highest levels of education are expected to live four years longer than those with the lowest education. And, uh, um, and being, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm coming from a working class family where my parents had no qualifications um, whatsoever. My mum was a cleaner, my dad was a squatty. And in a single generation, uh, my sister was the first one to get a degree. And now I'm moving on to get my PhD. There shows you that there's, um, there is social mobility and a movement that is, is capable of happening, but will that also reflect with how uh, um, our lives live no longer as we move forward? So you would have seen this already, I'm sure, or a version of this, but this is from Marmot's work that he did again with the Health Foundation. But I'm not asking you to look here about um, the difference between uh, um, um, death and, um, and looking at the fact that uh, um, the most deprived die, you know, 10 years ne or nearly nine years earlier, it's the key bit here is the, the lives lived with disease. And so the fact that our most deprived populations, this core 20 plus, as you see here, our most deprived populations are living about 20 years uh, um, with, uh, uh, say, diseased lives, with lives with uh, significant disease uh, um, going forward to their death compared to those who are, um, are we say, have the least deprivation. And so this is a key factor to their health and of course costs are uh, related to the NHS and their well-being. It's true for men, it's true for females. And again, they tend to live, uh, I'd say in females, if anything, it's, it's more exaggerated with their long lives with disease. And of course, this also ends up with these gaps in life expectancy. So nearly 10 for years for men and nearly eight years for women. This is. A, a huge and shocking, uh, uh, um, you know, and should be a shocking uh, uh, um, statistics as we can go through. So what can we do? What can healthcare do? What can integrated care systems do working together to address these wider determinants? It's not just about how we tweak the drugs or the, the individual technologies that uh, um, can affect people's health and how we change access. It's about this. So I want to remind you, 80% of your health outcome comes from these modifiable, wider determinants of health. And these are the things that we now have to start working together to focus on. So 
I can't see the questions because I'll look at chat and I promise I will look at the chat later on and, I, and we will do our best to, to answer those questions and capture them as we go through. But um, I'm just going to have a look at exploring some of the mindset required for integrating population health. So one of the key bits around us, and I think many of us on this will be working in, uh, um, in primary care or secondary care or public health uh, um, and local authority people whose uh, um, lives and everyday jobs are intertwined in healthcare. And I've spent most of my time working in secondary care before mo moving to NHS England and then the Health Foundation, but very rarely uh, um, was it for uh, um, a kind of a single kind of population. So what we have to be aware of is this medicalization of population health and population health management. These, these kind of approaches to dealing with wider determinants, which is what pop health has put us there for. So um, by this, I mean that because we know healthcare so well, and this is the data that we've been kind of um, brought up on using things like SUS and using uh, um, um, data from say ACORN or Mosaic, which again, looks at wider determinants, but often very much focused around healthcare. So how can we move beyond primary care and secondary care and those bits to, to look beyond that? And then our system leaders, whose jobs it is to make, that, to make their organizations very successful, how can we convince them that not to over-medicalize this. And of course, when you're dealing with clinicians and, uh, um, and bosses of hospitals are going forwards, how do we get them to think about that? So we've got to remember the medicalization and giving new pills or access to health directly or healthcare directly is not you know, population health and population health management in terms of, of its practice. So although obviously access to care is a necessary component, we also need to think about and, and, and put some actions in place around income security. And there's some wonderful work that uh, uh, um, uh, people have been doing to stop uh, um, people from losing their homes, because we know those who are homeless uh, um, um, die 30 years younger than the, I say, the, uh, I say, peer matched um, colleagues. That's 30 years younger. And I'm not talking about people living on the streets. I'm also talking about people uh, um, who are in shelter and accommodation under our care as well are part of those figures. So some shocking figures around that. What are we doing about education to ensure that people understand the risks and can better consume healthcare information, but also other information about their healthcare behaviors? Housing I've already covered, and the, there's wonderful work being done around prescriptions on uh, um, boilers on prescription and double glazing. And you know, we even know our you know friends over in the US are starting to do this for their insurance companies as well. Nutrition and food security being critical, of course, the environment. All of these play a big part in how systems, integrated care systems, will be working together to manage the health of the population and to address these wider determinants as we move forward. So there are some warning signs. So fellow analysts, economists, uh, our, our colleagues who are out there who are involved in this, you know, when you start to see, you know, or, you know, if we're viewing, uh, when you're asked to do some segmentation and you're segmenting just on medical descriptors, this is the warning sign that when you're starting to try and work as an integrated care system, that you might be looking at an over medicalization of how we, we manage these things. And also this emphasis on downstream drivers about these final outcomes. How do I stop the diabetic foot amputations? Because we seem to have some unwarranted variation between that. How do I look at the stroke or, or, or the uptake of flu jabs? What are the big things that we can do upstream to be able to manage this? So let's not concentrate on the small bits, but look at the bigger bits. So is the population health management paying attention to those upstream institutional systemat sy systemic and public policy drivers? And as integrated care systems working together, there is the opportunity to start to address those. And again, there are some wonderful examples that um, Sally will be sharing later on. What, in all of your analysis and the work that you're doing, what are you doing to drive and do something different about these wider determinants of health? So, uh, um, again, uh, uh, um, a little picture of this, this idea of we spend a lot of time, you know, looking at these downstream drivers. And again, this was a big part of my work, early work in population health management, where I was segmenting on outcome based, um, um, you know, uh, criteria. Why do we have so many people? Um, going on to get diabetes? Why are we looking at the number of people being admitted to hospital or readmitted to hospital? Uh, um, what do we do about those? 
and you tend to start thinking and because this is there's some of the stuff we know very well it's a well trodden path what do we do to help manage you know to move away from those things and then to start think about these um, bigger upstream macro problems what's causing the diabetes what can we do to better help uh, um, our population with that so is there stuff we can do around health and nutrition when they're young what can we do about uh, um, some of the kind of complexities around that I know that people will start talking about budgets and you know worrying about today's money and tomorrow but again Sally will come and chat to you about some of those conflicting and confounding factors that come with it one of the big elephants in the room is that this idea that collaboration between healthcare, social services and other sectors uh, um, is, is seen as the route to improving uh, population health. This is surely the answer. We'll all work together. We'll all deal with these wider determinants, Andy, and by working together, we will uh, um, fix this problem. But I say there is little convincing evidence to suggest that collaboration between local healthcare and non-healthcare organisations improves health. And on that kind of bombshell, I'm hoping this is where Sally picks up uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the work from here to be able to show that when you kind of look through the evidence, and there's this wonderful paper, I'll, I'll touch on it ever so briefly because I know Sally deals with it, but um, this paper from Alderwick that looks at all of these potentially confounding and conflicting uh, um, bits of evidence. There's also another paper from Unger who talks about this as well. Again, the, the, the multitude of conflicting things that will kind of come together that uh, um, will make it a real challenge for pe people to work together as we move forwards. Right, I have whizzed through my bits so we can get to the star of the show, um, Sally. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to have a quick look at the chat to see if there are any questions, if that's okay with everybody else. Let me uh, um, have a little look. Are there any questions or does anyone feel brave enough to ask any questions uh, um, 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 going um, forwards? Oh, wonderful that people are sharing their additional research uh, um, on there. So uh, um, a huge thank you uh, um, as we kind of go um, through. And I will post the links uh, um, to Alderwick and Unger's um, as Sally is talking as we go through, also to things like Hood and all the references you would expect for um, our papers as we kind of go through. Um, any questions before I pass over to Sally? Fabulous. So Sally, I will be driving the slides if that's okay. So uh, um, if there's a nod or a cue or a just get a move on Andy, I will uh, I'll do my best <laughs> to, to do it and as well as a look at the chat. So um, let me share my screen one more time. Um, and make sure that we've got the right thing. Cool. Has it come up, Sally? Yes, it has. Thank you, Andy, very much Perfect. indeed. Okay, so just to uh give you put your minds at rest also there's um there's a references slide at the bottom of the at the end of the presentation with some links into for those papers that andy's been talking about so um you'll get a double whammy of those so that's great thank you everyone for listening thank you andy for your great introduction um so working across systems moving on um, so I want to begin this uh, section of the presentation to actually just take us back to some basics, really, some basics about uh, a brief introduction of how we understand systems and how this can help us understand how they can impact on health and social care. So I'm going to start with a slide here on how systems work, um, Andy. So basically, working in systems is not a linear process. Uh, and processes are, though, components of uh, a system. So we can recognise processes as a series of what we would call connected steps or actions to achieve an outcome. OK, and they have purposes and they have functions, um, but on their own, they can't work entirely on by themselves. And the idea of this slide is to give you two examples of particular systems that will be very uh, relevant to all of you, both the, the, the cardiac system and also the London Underground system. Um, and I'm using those both as examples here. So if we think about the cardiovascular, oh, can you go back, please, Andy, a minute? If you go, if you think about the cardiovascular system, we're thinking about all the processes that help the blood pass through the heart and you can map this. 
Uh, you can show the route the blood takes. If there are any bottlenecks, it might be the cause of disease. Uh, and with the right equipment, you can measure how long it takes the blood to get to the ventricles of the atria, etc. Uh, and you can think about the important issues to understand the process. However, that's the heart is only one part of the system because the process of blood going through the heart is also affected, of course, by all sorts of other things such as exercise, hormones, disease, blood volume. And each of these also need to be understood if you're thinking about how the heart works. And this is not dissimilar in the London underground system. So this is made up of lots of different processes, again, from buying a ticket uh, to looking at the process of traveling by tube, say from Bank to Bond Street. Um, also thinking about how the system works together. You want to make sure that all those separate parts are running smoothly. So each process is part of at least one system and each system is part of what is often a larger system. So you can start to get a, a feel for the picture and the complexity. And this leads us to the theories behind what we call systems thinking. Thanks, Andy. So at its core, um, when we think about systems, we want to see how things are connected between each other so that we can have some notion of this whole entity. So if we consider a system as a perceived home, then whole, then we need to think about all those different parts. Um, and so our system thinking is around um, thinking about the NHS. OK, so we may think, um, for instance, that how health and social care is organised is actually known as what we would call a complex adaptive system. And there are many complexities. So it's a system that's coordinating action of some purpose. It's complex because we're trying to make sense of all those different varied relationships that are among all the parts of the system. Uh, and we want to make, we want to try and detail how behavior may, can be very difficult to predict, but we'd like to be able to predict that. We'd also like to think about how we can adapt in the sense that people who make up the systems can both change and evolve to new conditions in the environment. And of course, that's very much our focus when we're thinking about how to address um, the uh, determinants of health. So moving on. So when we're talking about system changes or about how we want some event to turn out, whether it's an epidemic, a war or some other biological or physical process, we, we kind of got some mental model of how things might fit together. And we think about this in terms of structure. So we think about the organizational boundaries, maybe the layouts of equipment, roles, responsibilities, teams, targets and goals. But we also need to think about patterns in terms of how people think and what they do, their relationships, their values, how they trust each other, how they communicate with each other, how they make decisions and any conflicts and power that might be introduced into that. And also then the process. So patient journeys, care pathways, supporting processes, funding, of course, uh, and then recruitment, equipment, etc. So this is a very complex area when we're trying to think about system change. Now shifts within the NHS over the past um, numerous years have actually identified how changes have been taken place. Andy, can you give me the next slide, please? So here's just a list of um, all the different changes that we've been subjected to. And um, we've been, they've been wide ranging reforms since 1948 um, and, and since the NHS was founded. And there's been a kind of emphasis on both organisational autonomy, competition, and also the separation of commissioners and providers. And this fundamental shift has actually moved us towards where we are now with system of integrated care that very much depends on this idea of collaboration and a focus on places and local populations, which are the driving forces for improvement. Now, the King's Fund looks at this and they think about population health as what we call a population health system. So we've got these four pillars there that they see as very interconnected um, and having action which is coordinated across them rather than thinking of wide determinants of health in one pillar, our behaviours and lifestyles in another, the ICS is somewhere else and then places and communities that we live in. 
And all of those areas have been, in some respects, siloed over the years, and we've tried to treat them separately. But the integrated care system's fundamental value base is to bring them all together. Thank you, Andy. So what we want to do is think about how we can improve population outcomes as a whole where everyone is receiving the right care in the right place at the right time. Fantastic aspiration, as you all know. And systems thinking, I guess, adds to the theories and methods and tools that otherwise we would use in population health. So we can look at new ways to understand and continuously test really the nature of things and how things work so that we can intervene and improve people's health. And here you have um, an example here of the functions of a, an integrated care system, um, thinking about integrating primary, secondary and community health uh, with public health, social care and third sector organisations, and also um, a system that manages a defined budget across a defined geographical area for a defined population. And this is the diagram that we use to think about your place and neighbourhood and how this system can contribute to those different levels. Okay, thanks, Andy. So within a population health system, we now focus upon collaboration and we're going to keep talking about collaboration. This is very much the focus of today because it's a new structure with a new governance arrangements and there is much greater integration across health and care systems. There are place-based partnerships uh, and there's also joint membership and multidisciplinary teams. And that collaborative working is based upon our understanding and engagement with populations through many agencies and communities. And so strengthening trust between those partner organizations and their leaders, when they're undertaking joint decision-making and creating system-wide leadership is basically based on a value and a purpose that they will share. So the process looks at geographical footprints. We're looking at providing uh, strategic commissioning and planning to aim to support the sustainability of services. But we need to think about providing joined up care pathways. And to do this, the language of this new system has been changed over time. So increasingly, we have been thinking about collaboration, partnership, networks, integration. OK, those are the words that you're starting to hear, but you've heard them all before. But we now have to recognise that people's understanding and concepts related to those words may very, very much differ. So thanks, Sandy. So we've we've looked at um, some of the literature on collaboration. Um, and over the past decade, we've seen um, this particular graphic as an understanding of partnering efforts, which takes you through the intensity of connecting, cooperating, coordinating and collaborating. And you can see this kind of low to high intensity of relationships that are built and the aspirations that go alongside that. And this helps us, I think, to understand all this legislation and reform so that we have increasingly moved from just working together through information sharing and the creation of what we would call quite informal relationships towards something with increasing consensus and the much more formal relationships through collective planning and joint decision making that we're looking at now in our integrated care systems. Thanks, Andy. So as the vision for the NHS has changed, so has our vision of how we work together. And across the decades, you can see how these relationships have been building across both health and social care organisations. And so we've been identifying this term of collaboration and it's nested in quite a wider continuum. So we can see, for example, following the purchase of provider slip in the 90s, by 2002, we saw the NHS structured around competition is best. Uh, the Lansley reforms of 2012 sought to shift power and cash away from providers, disbanding the regional health authorities in favour of the CCGs. By 2016, we've now seen this greater shift towards new re regional models of the sustainability uh, and transformation partnerships. And of course, now we're moving those integrate into integrated care systems. But you can see there that this looser and then much tighter 
idea of collaboration is actually represented in that continuum. Uh, and we need to be aware of what we mean by that, because we are all trying to speak the same language, but we need to be aware that people may have quite a different perspective on this. Thanks, Andy. Now, during 2018, um, the government um, delivered, was trying to deliver more than about 50 major transformation projects. And they needed to make multiple interdependent elements to de be delivered concurrently through collaboration. And this was seen as quite a multi-dimensional environment. So it increasingly cuts across many, many organizational boundaries. And there was acknowledgement um, that this was going to be quite a difficult uh, aspiration, if you like, to achieve. And they created, the NHS created what was called a maturity matrix, matrix for the integrated care systems to observe how objectives could be set out within the NHS long-term plan. And these, this idea is that the core capabilities, if you like, of ICSs wouldn't necessarily jump from being um, a, an immediate statutory function to a thriving ICS, that it would take time to build um, you know, the, the mechanisms and the capability and capacity to do this. And so they developed this maturity matrix and this is quite aligned to what we would call group dynamic theory. So we're looking at rather than having um, a progression model that's a series of binary checklists that you might tick off saying, yeah, well, I've done that. We're OK. This shows much more of a journey and also that all domains may not necessarily move at the same pace. Some people may be much further behind or much further in front what it does is actually start to support a much more nuanced and what we would call reflective understanding about how our systems mature. Uh, so this is good news for everyone, because if you were using this particular system of maturity matrix, you could actually identify where you think your partnership, um, whichever level you're working at, may be at that time. Now, um, not teaching my grandmother to suck eggs in the next slide. I already know that you're all um, collaborating really well. And I've been dipping into a lot of your amazing successes, uh, certainly um, with um, these examples, which I just want to uh, just speak briefly about, because I think they're fantastic examples of how the Midlands is collaborating already and they have some really fundamentally um, excellent projects to develop. Um, so the early intervention there in the upper right hand corner by Birmingham and Solihull ICS, they, they're working with more than a thousand health and care colleagues from seven different organisations to provide the right care for in the right place at the right time. And this is a seamless approach to encouraging people to recover faster and live much more healthy and independent lives, ideally at home. And it's helping to prevent unnecessarily hospital admissions and premature admission to long term residential care. So it's trying to reduce delays in discharge from hospital and also to help people to remain as independent as possible in their own surroundings, which is exactly what we want to hear about. Now, the idea of um, personalization is what matters to me um, is a focus of joined up care from Derbyshire. And this explains the importance of why people should have much more control and choice about the way their care is planned and delivered. Um, and it also considers both individual needs as well as people's preferences and circumstances. So it provides an all, rate, all age approach from maternity through childhood right through to the end of life, thinking about physical, mental and recognising the voice of carers. And it represents a new relationship between the people, professionals and the health and care system so that you've got this much more positive shift in power and also in decision making so that people can have a voice and they can also be heard and be connected within their communities. So it sounds a fantastic project. The community uh, and local transformation in Shropshire, um, Telford and Reckin, have a good start in their collaborative working. And they've been extending their rapid response services across the county so that vital care and support to residents, carers and families um, are given who need urgent care. So they now have a county wide service 
um, in planning this support. And they've learned a great deal from the vac successful vaccination programmes on how to connect and work in partnership with residents and communities. Um, Coventry and Warwickshire um, have been looking at their ICS and have a common vision for how partners can work together. Uh, and they've been looking at um, having uh, and health and well-being concordat. Um, so there's an agreement between two health and well-being boards which set out goals on how to enable people across Coventry and Warwickshire to pursue a happier and, and, and healthier lives, but also putting people at the heart of everything that they do. And in Staffordshire there, uh, in Stoke-on-Trent, the ICPs will be um, looking at their integrated care strategy and they're looking at including the determinants of health and making sure that both employment, well, all of employment, environment and housing issues have a critical role to play, um, making sure that they have joint action in their health and their, and their well-being outcomes. And that means looking at healthier environments and inclusive and sustainable economies. So some fantastic, some fa fantastic work there. OK, so we've been talking about the history of how the NHS have shifted to the point where we are at the moment thinking about integrated care systems and how collaboration as part of a continuum for integrated working is now quite clearly nestled and um, very much talked about in terms of the systems that we are working towards. Has anybody got any questions about what we've just been talking about briefly? Andy, if you take any from the chat or I can take any before we go on to our next part. So Sally, in the chat, there was uh, um, people saying that there was, these were great examples. Is there a particular reason why you've taken them from the Midlands? And I think I know the answer to this because originally this was part of the Midlands yes. Decision Support oh. Network. Um, do, are there other examples that you know of or have heard of around the country about um, looking you know, uh, um, around this kind of system working? Are you sure they're out there somewhere? Yes, and Nottingham has been working uh, very strongly and they have some good examples. All the, um, to be perfectly fair, if one is looking across all the health and wellbeing boards, there have been some fantastic examples of collaborative working. So I don't feel that people are not understanding that they have been working in collaboration at all, especially across CCGs and health and wellbeing boards. Uh, I think what's interesting about the presentation we're making today is a nestling it within a kind of systems theory to understand that though you may have great outcomes in some areas other people have also been talking about the challenges mm. and so even though um you may well have a really good history of working in some areas and you have some great outputs. In other areas, we found from some of the papers that you were identifying earlier and also historically in terms of collaborative working, there are an enormous, there is an enormous challenge in actually getting people to come together and trust yeah. each other enough to spend great pots of money and make some very difficult decisions as well. Yes. Uh, and so the next the next part of the presentation is actually about how we do face the challenges of working together. So I hope I hope this helps to, again, give some background. And even though we're being rather academic about the discussion, um, I'm going to be giving you some practical examples of how we've been using some tools in the past that we think might actually help ICSs now challenge some of those um, or, or address some of those challenges yeah, so no, we can uh, get into a bit more detail. Yes, thank you, Sally. And for those of you who didn't know, there was a wonderful talk earlier today um, from Alistair McClellan and Sir David Nicholson talking about the, the how people are making decisions, how are these big decisions being made and how from Sir David's experience uh, um, from being at, you know, a, a, a trust uh, chief exec through to running the NHS through to now being a chair of a, a number of organisations, how he sees it. And again, many of the things that Sally's talked about today were echoed there. There, there is a question here uh, um, for you, Sally. Would you say in general that this kind of collaborative working is something that needs VSM endorsement and bite for those VSMs, very senior manager, executive senior manager, those the, the highest bosses uh, of the NHS? Uh, um, are their systems getting things off at a ground and local level or does it always need to have a big boss involved? 
I think within the structure of the ICS is now, it goes all the way through. So it's both horizontal and vertical. Um, I think what we're looking at is the layering of the partnerships that are actually starting to develop at both um, regional as well as local levels. Uh, and we feel that the tools that we are starting to develop to support those partnerships should be actually adopted by all of those partnerships. Um, we think that trust and values and, and, and developing a, a joint purpose is incredibly important. Uh, and there is no, you know, there, there can be no complacency about the fact that you may have been uh, brought together as a statutory function that you're actually going to get on a, get on well mm -hmm. and actually make it work. And yes. it could take quite a long time for that to happen. Um, there may be more um, uh, carrots at the top of the table than there are in, in, in local in local areas for that to making that work. You know, there may be higher higher hoops to jump or whatever. But the issue is that um, there are fundamental reasons yeah. why systems work well together or not um, and all of those levels of systems will need to be taking that into consideration as they go forward yes. um, there is there can be I think I think my strongest message will be there can be no complacency about this and I think unfortunately there are many assumptions that well we're just here so this is just we're going to make it work but then we come across a lot of challenges and we're not perhaps quite sure how to go through those Yes. Now, uh, um, there are some questions here um, that I'm hoping that the next session that Sally talks about, where people are talking about how we can better understand how to make these decisions and go forward but, um, and, um, and talk about the role of data and analytics. But I think one thing that I've seen more and more, and I, um, um, I'm very lucky to, to be able to chat with people like us, McClellan and others through my day job, is this idea around decision analysis being so important now and how we work together. And this is a vital role that all analysts will play and we'll move on from us just doing maths and you know and doing some very very good maths or machine learning and data science and all this stuff but about how and our, uh, our, how we contribute to and our vital role in decision analysis and as you've alluded to Sally and I, I won't go into any more but I just say it's much more than maths it's much more than moving money like people have mentioned and we're working closely with people like the HFMA and AFA to come up with solutions and and just a, a little plug for tomorrow's session you will see five ICSs or hear from five ICSs who have gone through some of the work that Sally has done and uh, um, so these include Knotts and, uh, um, and Birmingham and um, Sally's been involved with that and how we're trying to make decisions together going forwards. But if there are no more questions, uh, um, well, I see them there and I promise um, Steve uh, uh, and the rest of the gang that we will come back to you to make sure that they're answered and give you the opportunity. But I'm hoping Sally's next bit will help. So um, okay. Sally, I will share the slides, two seconds. Can you okay. see it now, Sally? Yeah, thank you. So you can go to the next slide. So basically, um, what I want to talk to you about is thinking about going back to the literature, because we've been talking about collaboration for many, many, many years, and certainly in my own role. And I have had quite an eclectic, I guess, um, career, having started off as a nurse in intensive care and acute care. Um, but I've also, oh, but I've also moved towards... Um, I then worked within a within um, local government for quite some time um, within public health team uh, and then moved in, on to academia. But throughout that time and also I, um, I have some international charitable work that I've set up also in Eastern Europe. And one of the things that I found across all of it is that collaboration has always been the key. So I became incredibly interested myself in collaboration and started to write quite a lot about that. So one of the things that I, I found really useful as I went through that was looking at the work of Huxham and Vaughan. Um, and they've been exploring this whole idea of collaboration and focusing on why some collaborative initiatives tend to challenge those that are involved. So they, they perceived this increasing um, interdependency towards teams, but they also felt that just because you were working in teams didn't, didn't mean necessarily that you were always going to find solutions. Um, so they had two ideas about um, collaboration and they said, basically, you have to acknowledge sometimes that it's difficult uh, and it can be challenging. Uh, and it's also incredibly challenging as we were talking about making decisions as to how you get things done. So their two concepts were around, um, first of all, collaborative advantage 
And this captures what we would call the synergy argument to gain real advantage from collaboration. Something has to be achieved that couldn't be achieved by one organization acting on their own. OK, and this concept always provided this guiding light for the purpose of collaboration. But the second concept was about collaborative inertia. No, can you go back to the previous slide, Frank? Um, which captures the very, what happens in, frequently in practice when the output from a collaborative arrangement is actually quite negligible. Um, and the rate of output is extremely slow. Uh, and basically there's more pain than gain. Uh, and so it's, it can be quite um, a, possibly a negative experience. Uh, and it's quite basically a hard grind to get any successes. So from the challenges and dilemmas um, that this forms, we, we start to think about um, all the issues that we would manage to, to, to be concerned about. So whether it's about addressing aims or managing power, building trust, you know, knowing your partners, how do we make things happen and thinking about leadership, all of those things can actually give us either advantage or a little bit of inertia as we're thinking about these things as actually competing forces within the partnerships or within the, the collaborative um, environments that we're working in. Thanks, Andy. But Andy also mentioned um, Alderwick and Al uh, et al carried out their systematic review last year because they wanted to know whether actually the health systems and health organisations that were using uh, collaboration between local healthcare and non-healthcare organisations, um, how, how this worked. Um, so this was an attempt to identify the issues um, in one place um, with some kind of correspondence between, between the ideas. So you can see there that um, there was certainly um, an issue about motivation and purpose. People were worried about resources. They thought governance and leadership was important, relationships and cultures, obviously. And then being also ready to recognise the, all the external factors that also come in to those um, to those partnerships. So it's it's a key. Th these are key issues um, that are even now having actually been identified quite a long time ago, over 20 years ago. These things were being discussed in collaborative circles are actually continuously being identified as concerns. OK, thanks. So I've been also identifying um, these issues in the work that I've been doing. And one of the things that I found was that from my early exploration of what I was looking at in, in the early days about healthy, building healthy alliances, um, was actually thinking more um, in terms of what we would know as arenas of conflict. So we were finding that where diverse party um, partners um, were basically coming from their previously quite well defended boundaries, they will find it quite difficult to um, work together. And I found that the issues of conflict and change were quite inextricably linked together. Um, so I worked um, with the WHO and the Health Development Agency at the time to look at some characteristics that actually um, we could actually identify through a partnership practice tool to think about how we could build more sustainable partnerships in the UK within this function of, at the time, looking at public health contexts. And this tool had a kind of multi-dimensional approach and it looked at the overall issues of what we would call consensus and capacity in terms of mapping partnership characteristics across stakeholder beliefs and their mechanisms for thinking about how they would develop their work together. Uh, and we tested these out in uh, different pilots in primary care and social care partnerships, both in the UK and Australia. Um, and we started to develop a much more basic tool, which I've also more recently used for a clinical academic fellows partnership in, in, in um, an HEI. Uh, and thinking about identifying how people aspire and are motivated um, to organisations, organisational issues that help people to work together. So we started to recognise, as Andy and I got together, that this tool could be enormously important and useful for ICSs as part of their partnership journey. And we're actually quite keen to validate the tool now within the context of the ICSs, and we'll be thinking about doing that. So the tool itself, we move on, um, comprises of what we would call a partnership matrix. And so there is a, there's partnerships, uh, 
we, we measure basically the level of consensus and recognize the capacity in those seven critical areas of stakeholders, strategy, coordination, communication, project development, resource and review. And then all the members of a partnership are required to answer survey questions which are aligned to the cells of the matrix. And what we tend to do is look at both quantitative and qualitative feedback uh, and analysis in looking at this. Um, and it, it's we're able to then think about looking at the whole picture, seeing things through users' eyes by actually mapping out the results of uh, the feedback, which helps us to identify risks and give us time to train staff to tackle particular problems and find easier ways of doing things, but also to recognise that we need in our building of the collaborative entity to take small steps as well as what we would call some big leaps. Um, so when we're thinking about the opportunities and the challenges, going back to um, our previous slides with, with um, Bangdam and um, we were we are thinking, can you move on please, Andy? We were thinking about um, how do we map um, current challenges across these characteristics that we had listed there in that tool? Uh, and this is because we wanted to start to see how re much relevance this tool might have for us now. Uh, and so I was looking at the work of um, Thorns of some Wool and Bottery uh, only last year, and there were some real clear opportunities that were being identified, which we could map against our, our characteristics. Um, this is just a you know just to to have a look to see how re relevant, if you like, the tool is at the moment. But we can see that there are clear opportunities for ICSs, for stakeholders, and for developing strategies, etc. But people were also already having experienced a, a number of challenges. So they were looking at extending um, networks. Um, looking at how you could represent everyone and how much of a mix that was and people needed to be much more empowered and they also need to recognise their boundaries. Um, people wanted to recognise social care needed to be quite much more on the agenda and not just in the room. So there were quite a lot of critical issues, if you like, that were challenging those early developing partnerships, mainly from the sustainability and transformation partnerships, which is where this work was drawn from. So next slide. So we then started to also recognise the challenges in the collaborative journey. So from thinking about our vision and our values and our processes, how we can then build resources and our relationships uh, and, and, you know, reflect on what we're trying to achieve here. So Deloitte um, here also identified that ICSs um, would have a much more different approach in the way that they would improve population health but they were definitely unlikely to get it right first time around. And they saw the journey as much more of an iterative process that was continuously um, try, trying to address the evolving needs of both the local, the local population, but then also incorporating new technologies and interventions. So we identified these, what we would call beliefs and mechanisms from our tool um, in their partnership journey as they were starting to identify issues, which was around health consumering and consumerism and public health or the disconnection that we found between, they found between uh, vision and delivery. Also defining uh, the new roles and establishing how, what's different about this and the traditional roles that we had perhaps within our CCGs. We also wanted to enhance provider collaboration within our pop population health management at place and at scale. Uh, and there were also the misalignment of goals. And we were talking earlier about the different tiers of collaboration and where your goals may come from. It may come from local policies, but it may well also be driven by national policy and, and how difficult sometimes those are to align. And then again, also recognising, of course, that ICSs are systems that at different, their partners are at different stages in their implementation journeys. And that affects, obviously, their integration, levels of integration, their levels of budgeting and how they may participate. So we can start to see now the perspectives and complexities of the journey. So we, you know, we've been keen to think about, so how can we help, basically? Uh, what can we do? Um, yes, thank you. 
So we've been thinking, um, you know, we've been thinking more about um, uh, mapping the evidence, if you like. So we map some evidence from the list of opportunities and challenges onto the matrix. So this is now the, the tool that has its journey and its characteristics here. And what, what's interesting about it is how it offers a much more multidimensional framework. So you can start to see some clearer pathways for development. So for example, you know, we've got some nice green opportunities in the first box for vision, uh, but we've got in processes and resources, perhaps more challenges that we're faced. So how do we shift? How do we shift from being positive in the, in the early stages of a partnership development to actually facing those challenges in um, as we as we develop and, and, and try and put our ideas, our visions into practice, if you like. Uh, thanks, Andy. So um, what when people complete a survey for the tool, uh, basically the quantitative evidence within the tool um, is a result um, of Actually, in this particular example, it was a result of um, a partnership with 12 stakeholders. So this is an example of how you could read the results if you had all of your partners within one collaborative answering the questions. And the partnership for this particular example would be running for approximately about a year. And the green, tra the traffic cells are like the kind of low areas of consensus in red to higher areas in green. And so the level of consensus in many of the themes is good because it's green, um, which you would hope maybe a few more for the age of the partnership, though that can often be dependent on how often and frequently the partnership had been meeting. And in this case, the qualitative information also provided, identified there was little regularity in meeting and communicating. So there was less, uh, uh, less uh, green cells there across the horizontal line for communication. But what we did find was that multidimensional properties of the matrix also identify where conflicts could occur. So, for example, if the scores within vision, purpose and values are low, it's much more likely that there are going to be conflicts in the relationships and in the decision making and the allocation of resources. Uh, and this is fundamentally really, really important. And that's why at the bottom of this tool, you will see what we've called shared belief and mechanisms in place and what we've been talking about is if your results show that your shared beliefs are coherent and there's consensus, you're much more likely to have uh, agreed mechanism, me mechanisms in place to be able to develop and become an effective partnership. But if you have less agreement early on in your areas of shared belief, you're much more likely to come across um, fundamental conflict. And you might say, well, this is quite intuitive and it's quite obvious. And it is. And there are many tools that you will find. Uh, certainly many were, were developed in the 90s and, and in the early 80s and 90s to look at how partnerships could work much more effectively. But what was happening was that they became a checklist of things you could do, but you never actually saw the whole landscape, the whole system of the partnership in front of you. And that's what we found so valuable about this tool is that you can start to see the connections between issues both horizontally and vertically. We can also present information as a scatter plot. So here again, this is from a different partnership, but it denotes individual mean scores from each correspondent respondent. So this is the first of a series of plots for each of the areas that you can have for the characteristics. And this is the overall consensus. Uh, the top right quadrant is the recommended direction of travel. It's where you want to be. It's where the beliefs and mechanisms will share the highest scores. But some graphs that may have fewer people represented um, and they may have incomplete data, you may see a much longer line going into other quadrants. And what you actually want to do is obviously bring everybody up to the upper, the upper quadrant there. Uh, in this particular um, overall consensus, the overall mean score for the whole data set was about 2.98. So it placed the partnership in a kind of whole concept of operating in, in a medium to high capacity. Uh, and the overall mean scores for beliefs and part mechanisms are significant because of the concept of sustainability and effectiveness. So again, addressing the beliefs and mechanisms will help take you through to being a much more effective partnership. However, the range of consensus 
um, across the partnership. Um, if there's lack of agreement, then um, it's going to develop. Obviously, you're going to identify that through lower scores. Um, so it's also important to remember that the data represents scores from a number of different groups in the ones that I've given you. Um, and the and the most important issue about using the tool at all is that the collaborative ensures that everyone in the collaborative actually sends in their data. Otherwise, you'll get a, a much more mixed review. Now, again, I've been mapping um, what's been going on in the Midlands because that was an earlier an earlier presentation we were looking at what the midlands have been doing in terms of their stakeholders and strategy coordination communication etc uh, and it's been very interesting that there have been some lovely um presentations and um examples here of how stakeholders are working together there uh looking at partner members other members executives non-executives and there's some interesting examples of where people come from uh, there were different strategies that were being put together that were quite clear and well communicated. Um, people were looking at the coordination. Uh, and these are all um, examples from different uh, areas in the Midlands and their actual um, strategic um, uh, presentation. So I know that there are some very good examples out there and some of you can present those examples in terms of good, good practice. Uh, but there are others who were definitely struggling and haven't got so far. Um, in terms of the web-based um, survey um, that we're going to be developing for you, um, basically the tool previously had been paper-based and it was um, obviously quite cumbersome and slow. And we're now currently um, involved in planning the testing of this survey for web-based access. And the software for this um, particular um, web version has been used for confidential 360 degrees um, reviews at King's College and different universities across the UK. And so we'd like to pilot the tool across a larger partnership cohort in the new year. Um, and basically we want to assess internal consistency and also construct validity of the interventions being delivered across the local integrated care systems in terms of using this tool. Um, and we would have results, thanks Andy, that would start to look at um, uh, basically um, you, you you can use the app on your phone or you know on your on your computer and this is an example that we've made up obviously from from using the app so you'd actually strongly agree disagree agree or strongly agree particular questions that we will ask you about your partnership and we will also ask you for a comment about your partnership so the um we, we, we will receive both quantitative and qualitative information from you. Um, we also would expect the facilitator of the reviews, um, they will be given uh, all the total participant feedback, but when you submit it yourselves, if any of you end up being participants, you will get your own feedback yourself as well. And then we will offer further analysis considering the types of implications for training and development for that partnership um, from HEU. Um, the, for purposes of the validation of the tool, we will also be looking at um, participants completing an online survey as well, which we'll just look at, and we will possibly be doing some face-to-face -face interviews. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of a, a much more practical way of thinking about okay so how can we how do we know that our system our partnership our collaborative could be going in the right direction and how could we test or evaluate that so this is one way that we're putting an idea forward that you could be doing that and I know that Andy's team also have other ways of looking at things as well looking at how one might make decisions over to you Andy for a moment to see if there are any questions Cool. Thank you ever so much, Sally, and thank you again for those people. I, I will. We will try to work through the questions uh, um, right now, and uh, um, and give you a chance to ask Sally um, some some more of the detail. But say, hopefully, you know, today you you seeing how what we're doing at Insights is trying to build upon the presentations after each other. So what we heard from uh, Sir David earlier, what we've heard from Sally this afternoon, and again what we'll hear from the ICS is, I think that it shows that analysts 
uh, and so many of us who are watching uh, who come from the analytical field will have a natural uh, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, I'd say a natural affinity to decision making. This is a key part of our role. And many of you in the chat have already mentioned the real struggle that we have with uh, um, um, engaging others and being a key part of that. And I think you'll see as our role evolves that it becomes not just the maths, but as you say, it's how we broker these relationships, how we use maths to build a um, an indisputable evidence base, but that alone won't make the change happen. It's, it's making sure that people believe that the insights that you guys provide are the insights that will drive change and everyone agrees that. So a real challenge um, going forward. So uh, um, um, let's have a little um, uh, start with some of the questions. So Sally, what role do data and analytics play in systems collaboration? Has there been any effort to improve data quality and the ease of data sharing that you've seen in your research? Oh, interesting. So um, I would suggest that, um, yes, I think that I think the question, the key sentence there is the ease of data sharing. I think that I think that's been an enormous challenge to the health service, to the NHS for years and years. And um, I think part of the ease of data sharing has to be the effectiveness of trust. So there are going to be protocols and there are protocols for easing data sharing and inevitably, but there's also quite a history of lack of trust between organizations across our sectors. Unfortunately, there has been an enormous amount of silo working. There's also been an enormous amount of competition for funding. So ease of data sharing is something that is a fantastic aspiration, but if you're going to be doing it, you also need to be building the trust within those partnerships. Uh, the actual, you know, um, nuts and bolts of data sharing itself is, you know, is back to those that are working in computers and analytics. But for those people that can trust to understand what data sharing and the concepts of data sharing actually mean, means that you have to actually build those relationships because people are still not going to be that comfortable with it. Uh, and we're talking here not just about across organisations, we're talking about patients, we're talking about patient involvement here as well. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and, and just to say, certainly from our side and um, uh, um, and in AFA, I see, and, and I, this is why I love the fact that this insight sessions are called the science and craft of decision making, and it's primarily you know uh, focused on analytics. And I think that you'll see a lot more that this terminology around uh, of decision analysis and what we do and all the parts that we play is around making these decisions. And and as Sally's alluded to, we're expecting people to get on. And lots of these people have had competitive relationships in the past, uh, and we've been stealing staff from each other. We've been uh, uh, um, stealing grants and money from each other or, 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 or kind of um, bidding against each other. There's a whole load of history that we have to get past to suddenly uh, um, get along and play. But I think data and analytics can offer uh, um, um, the, a tool, something that people can all get behind if people believe the data and go from there uh, um, going forward. But as you say, data sharing, not just IG about if it's appropriate, but why should I share it with you? Because you may use it to beat me with a stick as you have been for years uh, um, um, before. Um, next question. How do you encourage more servant leadership, enabling others to do their best work? Yay. Well, I'm quite, I'm, I'm a real advocate for, ser for, for servant leadership um, theory. Um, and I think um, obviously role modeling is key. Um, but I do think that within the within the different levels of partnerships, I would hope that rotating leadership and coordination is going to be um, is, is possible within essence so that everybody gets a chance, an opportunity, even if it's shared leadership um, to actually experience the, the, the requirements, if you like, of leadership and, and, and perhaps coordination of those partnerships. I think that's going to be really important. Uh, I also think role sharing and understanding each other's roles is going to be incredibly important as well. So why you've got stakeholders at the top of the characteristics within our tool is because we see stakeholders fundamentally the partnership. And if we don't get it right at the very beginning, and that means if it means signing a partnership kind of agreement to say how many times you're going to turn up and that other people in your organisation recognise you're there and what your role is and that other people within the partnership recognise your role um, and how long you're going to come for, et cetera, et cetera, is really important. Uh, and I certainly have seen in the past 
you know, you can scapegoat numerous different parts of uh, different organisations across different levels of health and social care. Oh, well, they never come to these meetings. Isn't something we want to hear anymore, you know, whether, you know, whoever it is, whichever discipline it applies to or, or, or sector. So I think it's going to be really important that we're very transparent and um, there is this greater level of sharing between all the different types of stakeholders that you're going to get within these different levels of partnerships. Uh, but you also create the opportunities for enablement and empowerment. Uh, and, that's, and that's part of our, I guess I'm selling the tool to you, but I think it's part of the tool because you could use it at the very beginning of an ICS uh, just to identify what you don't know. And we'll know that you won't know it, but it means what do you start with first? Or you can do use it after six months to a year to see how you've been getting on. Um, and it's basically saying, well, because I did notice a question earlier about, well, should, maybe we should use conflict management, facilitation, hmm. mediation skills. You know, let, let's invest in that. But the problem is you need to invest in lots of things to make this partnership effective. Uh, and to use the tool would help you to decide what you need to use first, because if communication horizontally comes out as pretty red, you're going to know you're going to set up your communication strategy first, because that's the thing you need to focus on. But if there are other issues like how to write a strategy or where to get resources from that people are starting to be a bit hazy about, so the colours aren't great, then you might move within your training programme towards those issues as well. But this is also down to resources. And so you've got resources both horizontally and uh, vertically within the part within the tool because we recognize you bring resources as yourselves but you also have to have not only building internal resources within the partnership but you have to access external resources to keep you going and to sustain yourselves as well so i, I think um i think there are there are different different tools you can use to develop um training tools to develop yourselves definitely uh, and I think conflict management is incredibly important. I think communication skills are very important. And he's been talking about decision making skills, which is paramount to ICSs. But in terms of where do we start, which one do we use first? It's possible that this particular tool helps you to decide that. Mm -hmm. you know no, no. which direction to go I don't know if that helps but no uh, well I, I think it does if, if not please I, I'm coming to the chat but I think uh, um as I say uh, um you just need to finish this tool Sally come on it's been years what, what you know what are you doing no, um, <laughs> but anyway uh, I, 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 I'm joking everyone and to say that there's some wonderful work and I'm hoping um certainly uh, um in the very near future uh, um we'll have um some real life examples of people using this tool that we're going to be able to share at these kind of events so say for me I think Sally's work is 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 so uh, um, incredibly timely when we're trying to see all the questions that we've seen here, all of these conflicting factors, how do we come together? Um, another question. Do you think more organisations involved, the harder it gets? You know, do some organisations think collaboration is takeover? Oh, more people, more difficult? Mm, OK. So I think there are two things for me that comes out of that. The first thing is how big a partnership, um, because you get to a kind of optimum point where too many people around the table, it just doesn't work very well. So I know that there are statutory functions on the partnerships and there are identifiable partners that you need to involve. Right. So that's that would be my first criteria is to look at who you absolutely need to have around the table, but then to think about who that you have a wider group of stakeholders that you involve at different times um, because because you still need to engage, engage with the wider the wider group uh, and it may well be you engage them because they're specialists whether they're patient specialists or they're um, clinical specialists or whoever or data analyst specialists but they don't necessarily have to sit there every single week or every single month when you have your partnership meetings having said that there is um a bit of a, a crux and you've been to these meetings so you go to a meeting with 20 people making de a decision which Andy's team are looking on is going to be much more difficult than if you make a decision with 10 people inevitably uh, so I think you do have to also think about what the optimum number is for decision making uh, and certainly decision making tools help you to look at that and think about the types of decisions you're having to make so because there's, there's, there's issues about making decisions and there's issues about consultation. So there's a continuum for engagement and you have to decide whether you're actually engaging and consulting or whether you're making final decisions 
and who needs to be around the table for that. So I think these areas are optimum um, uh, for decision making effectively. And I think you'll probably have to develop those yourselves, but using the, the appropriate tools to do so. I don't know if that helps. And it, it really makes me say how long is a piece of string. But I think obviously smaller, tighter groups are easier and more efficient. But in terms of um, ICSs and then ICPs, you may well find that you can't say no to some organisations. Uh, and the other issue is, yes, people will come with a different perspective of collaboration. And they will think that this is a bit of a takeover, but you have the opportunity to develop your own culture in your partnership. Mm -hmm. And these are very independent partnerships. I think that's one of the, the good things about them is that they're being offered to you as will you create your own? You know, we're giving you some money, we're giving you goals, we're giving you some statutory functions, well, quite a lot, actually, and we're giving you a list of people you have to invite. But the culture and the way of working that you develop often becomes standalone for that partnership. Uh, but you have the opportunity to do that and to think about what works for you. Yes, no, thank, thank you very much. Um, there's another great question about training and facilitation, mediation and negotiation. I think we've uh, we've addressed that one and say absolutely, but where appropriate and has highlighted for the needs of those organizations and how we uh, move forward from there. Uh, um, so then the next question is, you know, you know, we are focusing on outcome information to justify change. For example, using quality. Do you think we can develop recognized qualities to help build trust? And qualities, I'm guessing here we're talking about quality adjusted life years as a, you know, uh, and again, I, I obviously have a view on this as a health economist uh, and some of the work we're doing. But Sally, your thoughts first. Uh, no, is there a common metric, I guess? Well, I'm not sure there is, to be perfectly honest at the moment. I think that the um, I think that I think the metrics that are out there in 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 terms of the health determinants, um, we are we're very keen to have the wider to look at the wider determinants to him and to have wider engagement. I think that's that's a quality in itself. But I do think that um, in terms of your own areas and we're talking about place based partnerships. So you're going to have different issues within different areas. Um, so you're going to need to very much adjust your focus to your own population areas uh, and the determinants that you want to address. And so fundamentally, the, the tool that I'm talking about identifies where you are and how you can improve your relationship. So it's very much a process driven tool. But if you if you develop your processes well, you will have effective outcomes inevitably because you'll all agree and you'll go forward and you'll move forward. And the most effective partnerships are all green in the cells and they're working well together. And the ones that aren't having very good outcomes are not, you know, have red cells or orange cells because they can't make decisions together. And there's a lot of in, basically a lot of infighting and conflict. And mm. it takes longer when you have that. Yeah. So I think I think if they were qualities in the way you're looking at it, I'd say then, you know, qualities for trust. Well, you know, look at the characteristics of the processes that you need to go through. Mm. Yes, and, and just to say, uh, um, as our part, we, we are actually using qualities to, to help try and bind together a common view of these different interventions. So how do how do um, the population value this? So it's not just what healthcare professionals and what some dusty old uh, um, academic paper that maybe me or my team have written um, that say about it. It's what individual communities value yes. and so it's about and of course that changes when you've got different communities in your population so you know the different parts of where i live in hackney will have very very different views as we have an afro-caribbean population a jewish population we have a, a middle, white middle class population a turkish population all of us how we consume healthcare how we want healthcare is very very different so we may value the same intervention very differently and so we're we're, we're using qualities with um, and the people, uh, um, you know, and the public, people with lived experience, carers, but also healthcare professionals and moving beyond that to come up with a common, I say, a common way of comparing uh, boiler on prescription versus lung reduction surgery. How do you compare double glazing to uh, uh, um, cancer treatment for your lung cancer caused by CPD? So there are ways of using qualities around this. And again, tomorrow's session uh, uh, deals with how we're trying to do this. But um, I say it's one part of what Sally's talking about. But for us, it was 
a, a way of kind of coming to a common understanding of what we value. And if we value these things, how do we resource the things that we value? So uh, um, so more on that tomorrow if you want to join. Um, uh, there's a comment around um, you know, the need for national direction uh, on data sharing. And uh, um, there's been some new, um, for those of you who don't know, there's been some new announcements coming out um, recently about um, maybe the inappropriate use of Section 251 for data sharing. That um, certainly for things like segmentation and risk stratification uh, uh, will have a profound effect when looking at aggregate, aggregated data that you cannot re-identify. So if there's no intervention for the individual linked to it, Thing, but that's another whole bag of uh, uh, another hour of ranting at you. So uh, um, the next question, uh, do you think budgets need to be pooled to optimise collaboration? Pooled. Pooled together, yeah. Uh, I think it would go a long way to, to build trust. But I think um, going back to an earlier comment that I made about the stakeholders and partnership agreements, one of the things that we did find early on uh, working across these different levels of collaboratives is if stakeholders knew why they were there and what they were bringing to the table uh, and how and, and that, that was openly transparent that was really important so yes to pool budgets I would say um, but you will find some stakeholders won't be able to match pool budgets um, and so people will be bringing different things so that's why the resources implication is really important because resources can be about budgets but they're also about other things as well and so I think it's actually about having a resource strategy that's very clear that there will be some yeah. pool budgeting, but there will be recognition of other resources that people um, can bring. And actually, you can't you can't survive without. So it's yeah. not just about money. And I think that is really important to recognize. Yes, no, I, I, um, and I agree. We're, we're working with the Healthcare Financial Management Association, the HFMA. Many of you may know it. It's the charity that supports um, the chief finance officers and the accounting structure within the NHS and beyond uh, um, on, on how we move money. And I know people have mentioned this in the chat before. Moving money is ri ridiculously difficult. And to be able to, um, but also not just moving money, but the rules and processes for moving money are yeah. very different for each organization. So again, finding a cohesive way of being able to say, okay, I will pay for that, but how do you pay me back? Because I still need to pay for my staff and keep the lights on. Again, a, 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 a monster problem, but pooled resources from the start may, may change all of that thinking if and when it happens, but we'll have to see. Um, how do we promote collaboration and interoperability across systems where data is sat in isolated silos? How do you indeed? Okay. We've got three minutes. <laughs> oh, in three minutes. Right. OK, I'll probably get, probably give it 30 seconds. Um, I think I, this is, you know, this goes back to our data analysis, um, sharing data discussion, doesn't it, earlier as well. So we do need data, pro data sharing protocols. We need to be very, very clear what it is we require uh, to move forward. So we need, you know, projects, strategic coordination and project planning is enormously important for all of these partnerships. Um, and you, there will have to be some agreements on data sharing at some level. Um, but you have to also think about what, what it, why do you need it? What, what is it? What is it being used for? Why do you need that share? Um, and who, who could be responsible for certain aspects of the development of the work? Um, because I think one of the issues that Andy's pointed out to us quite clearly about both you know, sharing finances and sharing data is you're having to go through so many hurdles. Mm. And even, even though we'd all like to live in the utopia where we can do all these things very quickly, if it's going to drag you down, then actually you need to be much more pragmatic about it. Because what you need is to move towards the outcomes. And it's not enough to just to tell your patients or groups or whatever, oh, but we're still looking into that data sharing protocol. It's hard work. So you're going to need to think more creatively about, OK, so who owns the data? But what can we do within that constraint at the moment? Even though, of course, you should contribute to as many discussions as possible in how you can move that 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 epic problem forward because it is it is epic and as these partnerships are developing and moving forward it's going to become much more challenging cool sorry You've so got... i haven't got great news but i've got be positive and think and creatively <laughs> 10 seconds for our last question 10 seconds for our last question do you see a common sense of purpose emerging in ics's you have worked with a bit like the way the british rowing team have 
the simple question, does it make the boat go faster? Ten seconds. <laughs> Yes, yes, I do. And I think it's everything that we've been talking about within the structure of the tools, that if you have agreements in your beliefs, so if you if you if you actually share your belief systems as to why you're there, what you want to achieve and what you what, what's good for you and your organisation and what's good for the local population and the local community. And these things marry up. You can go forward. I think what what doesn't work is when you often as a person turn up in a partnership, you have your own beliefs, the partnership beliefs and the organisation you're representing and, and you're actually in conflict yourself. So you need to kind of sort that out yourself and work out what it is you're heading for with both those issues, yourself, your organisation and then the partnership and then share work towards sharing that together and looking at the benefits. Thank you, Sally Markwell. As always, you've been wonderful and amazing and a, a, a wonderful 90 minutes of my life spent with you. So thank you for all of the information. Thank you for those who joined us. So especially the Stevens, no, Stephen, Stephen and Steve, who asked a load of questions and Shona, all of the S's, Jenny, Alex, all of the rest of the guys. Thank you ever so much for joining us. You'll be able to see this and look back at it on the video. Please join us tomorrow for some more about how we get systems working together. And say, I very much look forward to um, seeing uh, uh, more work from Sally. So thank you everyone for joining us today uh, um, and spending your time with us. A huge thank you to you, Sally. I owe you yet another drink uh, uh, um, for all of this hard work. And um, uh, enjoy Insights, everyone, and I'll see you soon.